Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the importance of providing services to people with disabilities with our special guest, Matthew Van Auken, Executive Director and CEO of Developmental Pathways. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to learning about what you're doing and about your great expansion that's that's uh, that's coming up. Thanks for, for uh, spending some time with us. It's my pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me. So let me set you up uh, a little bit, because one of the things that really gets to me is that people with various disabilities, and it could be seeing disabilities, it could be hearing disabilities, it could be physical movement disabilities, it could be that one is affected by some sort of a disease or developmental issue, that could be learning disabilities. There's so many people who are affected by this, yet these people are marginalized in the services that are provided so important are sometimes hidden and in the shadows. Your role in Colorado is so important to civil society. Talk a little bit about your clientele. Who do you serve right now? My pleasure. So Developmental Pathways is one of 20 what are called community-centered boards. Those community-centered boards help provide service coordination and case management in a regional part of Colorado. Those 20 span the entire state of Colorado and have done so for um, almost 60 years. So we will celebrate our 60th anniversary in uh, July of next year. Part of our uh, organization for most of that time was also a direct service provider for those individuals. Uh, We have since, because of a federal requirement, split our organization. And so we have uh, divested all of our direct services. And now we are a service coordinator and a case manager for uh, folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities and delays from birth to end of life. So we have a very robust early intervention program that serves kids from zero to three years old with federal and state dollars. And then we have a very robust uh, service coordination and case management uh, team that helps children and adults with developmental disabilities to access funds, Medicaid or local funds, to then be provided their um, the services and supports that they need so that they're not marginalized, um, so that they are able to lead the most meaningful life possible. And for those folks who don't qualify for uh, Medicaid dollars, we are fortunate enough that the counties that we work with for over 20 years now have invested mill levy dollars each and every year to support those individuals that live in their counties. So we help to coordinate the services and supports for those individuals as well. For a total of about 9,000 Coloradans each and every year, uh, with a team of about 350 staff that are uh, helping us to do that important work each and every day. So talk a little bit about the difference between direct services and the work that you do. Direct services is is very specific, right? You're, You're providing... Um, a particular discrete service, you're getting uh, paid for it in, in, in some ways, either through government funding um, of various sorts or private funding. But the work that you're doing is part advocacy. It's part being a traffic cop. It's part being a knowledge base. Uh, talk a little bit about how you interact with various individuals on the one hand and families on the one hand and organizations on the other, be it governmental or other nonprofit organizations. So you hit the nail on the head throughout that entire uh, space. We advocate a lot. We help individuals advocate for themselves, families to help advocate for themselves, whether uh, they're in direct services with provider agencies or in their school systems. And it's power. Also, it's really about well, power, right? It's empowering. Uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, you have to have knowledge, right? Knowledge is power. And so part of our service navigation and coordination is to provide connections to individuals with disabilities and their family members and their advocates, whether they're self-advocate or they're supported by a team, so that they have all of the information that is available to them to ensure that they are optimizing the federal and state monies that are available, the local dollars that are available, that they know all of the different providers. There are, uh, so direct providers do things like transportation to and from 
a job for a young adult with uh, Down syndrome, let's say, who might work at a grocery store down the road from you. Um, they may have a job because they love to work. That's where you meet your friends. That's where you meet your uh, mentors. It's where you might meet your boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband. Um, so an individual with an intellectual or physical disability uh, wants to live the same sort of life that you and I do, obviously, and uh, but they may not be able to uh, pass a driver's license test or if they're in oh, a well, I have a car and I'm driving, right. I'm in the direct services business. That's the that, that's part that, of that's it. exactly right. That's exactly right. And so as a service coordination uh, agency, we help to coordinate all of the information in our geographical area as well as help those individuals who do qualify, many of the folks that we provide services for qualify for what we call Medicaid funding here in the state of Colorado, which is basically $1 is 50 cents of federal money, uh, tax money, and 50 cents of state tax money. And that $1 is then able to pay that transportation provider to get you to and from work. It's uh, to pay that DSP or direct support professional, of which there's a significant, as you might imagine, there's a significant need for uh, DSPs and home health workers and folks like that across the entire country because Medicaid rates are so woefully low that historically we've had a really, really hard time finding great folks to work uh, for those provider agencies. Um, but those are the folks who, um, you know, we have uh, we have individuals in, the, in our service, part of those 9,000, that have an intellectual and developmental disability. They also have behavioral needs. They are also in a wheelchair and are on a G-tube, and they live in a group home with 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, seven direct care staff um, that, as you might imagine, right, has a really, really hard job. Um, those are direct care and direct support folks. Um, and so we do our very best um, throughout our area to make sure that we're connecting, again, folks with the level of services that they need to lead their most meaningful life. Now, my understanding is that um, part of what's going on right now is that there are shifts uh, going on across the country, including in Colorado, to provide uh, better service at in more efficient ways. So um, to serve more people, could you talk a little bit about what you see coming down the pike and what you're going to be adjusting to over the next several years? Absolutely. So here in Colorado, as I mentioned before, uh, for the better part of 60 years, we were a direct service provider and a Medicaid waiver service coordinator for only folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's a lot of folks and it's incredibly rewarding work that's done by an incredible staff um, of professionals that we have here. But as you know, Mark, it's a very complicated and complex system at it on a good day, right? At its very best, it is a really, really precarious and complex system because in order to qualify uh, to spend federal, state, local dollars, you have to go through a lot of barriers. You have to jump through a lot of hoops. You have to do a lot of things to prove that you have a disability, um, that you have that you meet certain financial requirements. Um, you have to make sure that right you proof of residency, and you have to go to the doctor, and you have to go to the county human services department. Right? It's story and, and 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 compliance trap. Right? I mean, in that's order right. to ensure that money is well spent, you have to have oversight. Sometimes oversight can be as burdensome and as costly as the service itself. So how do you create the right balance? And, and what's Colorado's emerging uh, take on this? So we, we, are, uh, we are a lean and mean operating machine, to be sure. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, ultimately. And so we have a responsibility to our funders, to our board of directors, right, to the counties, to make sure that we keep our management and administrative costs uh, to the lowest possible number that we can. Um, hovering somewhere around, you know, 12, 12 or 13 percent um, each and every year. The rest of those monies go directly to individuals and families in need. Those go to the staff that help to provide all of that service coordination and connection. Um, and Colorado in and of itself is really a, um, a, a beacon of hope in regards to how can how well can you do your job uh, for the monies that you provide. Um, there's a national uh, organization that provides a state of the state 
uh, report each and every year. And Colorado is regularly in the top 10 of all states in uh, the things that we measure and are deliverable for people with disabilities, even though we hover somewhere around the 45th out of 50 states for total funding per person. So um, the, the magic there, if I'm being uh, direct and honest with you, is that we provide those services at a local space. A lot of states across the United States do state level case management and state level coordination and have statewide providers or even national providers that don't know the community and they don't know um, uh, how to connect everyone and to navigate in a way that ultimately makes the most sense for that individual in their community. Um, and so Colorado has, has led in that for years. You're making a point which, which we advance um, at, at at, at our uh, organization, which is that there are a lot of different solutions to problems and local knowledge is so very important to providing those solutions in an efficient way. Now, you're going to scale up over the next couple of years. So uh, talk a little bit about why you're scaling up and how you expect your services to continue to morph. Yeah, we are so excited about uh, the next 18 months or so. As part of the uh, addressing of the conflict issue at the federal level that the state of Colorado and all other states that receive Medicaid dollars for people with developmental disabilities and physical disabilities, they have to be in compliance and have that full separation. But they also recognize that today in each of those geographical areas throughout our state, there are 64 counties. Um, and uh, today, if you live in one of those counties, if you have a physical disability, you have to go to what's called a single entry point. If you have a developmental or intellectual disability, you have to go to a community center board, which we are. So at the very beginning for a family or an individual who may move here um, or is born in Colorado, they have to make a choice that can significantly impact the rest of their life. So if you and have if a physical get it, disability, you go in one direction. If you have a developmental disability, you go. But a lot of people with developmental disabilities, particularly as they age, it intersects, right? But 100 percent. Now you're in one system or the other system. And, and what do you do? Right. Then you have to go back through this whole thing. And then you, then people are likely to say, what, you're out of compliance because you're getting too much money from too many different people. You've got too many people serving you. Everybody's talking in their own little silos. So, so what are you going to do? How, how, how is this going to be resolved? That's exactly right. So, uh, so recognizing that, gosh, one in six children are born with a disability uh, across the United States, one in four adults will have a disability in their lifetime. So while you and I may perhaps not have a disability today, uh, chances are, as you mentioned, as we get older, we're going to need some supports with memory care, or dementia, um, physical movement, things like that. So uh, for almost all Americans, it's just a matter of time. People with developmental disabilities and folks who are born with uh, physical disabilities, like my little sister, uh, Kelly, who passed away eight years ago, she was born with muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy. And so um, it's easy to recognize that from a young age, but eventually we're all going to need those supports. And you're absolutely right, Mark. A great many of the folks that we serve today that have an intellectual or developmental disability or uh, what we uh, what a lot of advocacy organizations are calling uh, being neurodiverse, um, they also have mental health support needs, behavioral health support needs, and physical health support needs. Um, and so you're right. Sometimes that bifurcation can create um, a, a harder time in an already complex system for folks. So what Colorado is doing, um, and we applaud them for this, is that they're making one organization for an entire area. So there's only one place that you have to start with to understand all of the different options that are available and support and to connect with those providers. Right. It's, the I'm sorry? it's the multi-service center concept, right? So That's exactly right. You talk with one person and they become the person who can take care of your needs, right? That, That's no, right. Personally, right? They're the travel right. cop, they're the advocate. So you've got to train up all your people, right? That's exactly right. So today in early intervention services from zero to three, there are about uh, 12,000 or so children in the whole state of Colorado. We serve a quarter of them. Uh, we like to say that we're the largest nonprofit in Colorado that you've never heard of until you need us. Um, and there are roughly 75 to 80,000 children and adults 
that uh, qualify for Medicaid waivers across the state. Um, so what will happen with us over the next 18 months is that we'll go from serving about 9,000 individuals to 17,000 in one year, uh, which means that we're, uh, we're, we are blessed and have the opportunity to almost double the size of our team that provide direct service, uh, pardon me, uh, service coordination uh, to all of those folks who may qualify for Medicaid. So we're really excited uh, to move in that space because we feel like we figured out sort of the, the secret sauce, if you will, um, the, uh, what, I, what I like to call Cherry Garcia, which is my favorite uh, Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Maybe you, you all could get a sponsorship for this webinar. Um, uh, uh, we certainly don't, um, although I've eaten my share, but um, you know, it, it's that special magic that it takes. And so we rely on, uh, on creating really, really tight and important and individualized services and supports for the team members that work here so that they in turn can do that for the people that we serve as, as executive leaders in nonprofits, as you know, better than I do, Mark, our job is to make sure that the folks that we employ that are our team members that are doing the hard work each and every day, it's fulfilling, but hard work that they have all of the resources that they, that they need. So, you know, we're doing hybrid uh, solutions to working and we're allowing folks to have as much flexibility in their work as possible. Uh, tuition reimbursement and, you know, paying at market or better. We're, we're doing all of these things that we can to make sure that we support folks because at the end of the day, they're caregivers. And as you know, you've got to put your uh, mask on first before you help others. And so we always want to make sure that uh, the, the people that we're fortunate enough to get to work with each and every day feel like they're supported by us so that they can take care and serve properly the folks with uh, disabilities. One of the things that I think is, is really important to note is that this is part of a consolidation. So one of the things that, that everybody should be aware of is that this is not just expansion. It's contraction as well. We have we are contracting the workflow force in one place where there is a lot of overlap and there's a lot of redundancy, removing the redundancy and moving those that workforce under a under a, a different umbrella. A lot of these people who will come on will be trained. They will That's exactly right. their experiences that are additive. Now they can expand their horizons. They can provide, they can get better benefits. They can get better support because of the economies of scale. So this is a matter of not only creation, but it's also creative destruction, right? You're, you're basically saying to uh, certain people who have provided great service, we're going to employ you in a better context in a in a context where you can actually exercise more of your skills and have more support, it's more efficient. More people get served, and the cost per service unit is lower, which allows for expansion without additional funding. Right? It's it's really interesting. Now, it doesn't mean that the funding streams don't shift, and you know there is funding that that comes from different places. But the whole idea is. You're becoming smarter, better, scaling up, but remaining local as well. How do you maintain that local character if you're going to be expanding so much that you started off this conversation as, as calling out as one of the, the major values of your organization? So you articulated all of that really well because the realities are we will, a year from now, 48 or so, 45 or so agencies across the whole state of Colorado provide those case management and service coordination services. 18 months from now, it will be 20 total. And right. so if you think about that for just a second, that's 20 IT teams, that's 20 HR teams, it's 20 CEOs uh, versus the 48. So there will be a, I believe, a fantastic savings. Now, obviously, when we double our size, we will need more IT folks. We will need more support folks, obviously, but not at, to the degree or the level. So as you grow and expand, you're absolutely right. There really is strength in numbers, and it allows you to be more efficient and effective. To answer your uh, last question, because we understand our community, the services and supports that individuals in Medicaid need, whether they have Down syndrome or whether they have cerebral palsy, whether they're in a wheelchair or whether they're nonverbal, 
by and large, what those folks need in their community can be and are being provided by the same group of provider agencies. And so we, it's our job to make sure that we can connect all of those folks to all of those services. Sometimes in an area, the one agency that does work for folks with uh, just physical disabilities versus the developmental disabilities don't have the same um, uh, direct connections throughout their community because for many folks with a physical disability, you may need less touch points and you may need less supports to navigate through that incredibly cumbersome paperwork and red tape that again, that oversight is important because you never want uh, Medicaid fraud and you never want any opportunity where folks aren't spending our tax dollars the way that they're supposed to spend them. But they may have less need for um, enhanced services or person-to-person -person services. Well, we've been doing that for almost 60 years. And so that level of service, we hope to be able to take and move into uh, that realm for folks with physical disabilities so that they appreciate all of the incredible services that are available in their community today. Well, that's that, that's a very good point. In other words, we all trying to be as self-sufficient as we possibly can. If we're deprived of the opportunity to, to find service, we very often do without. You see this with people who are um, who, who have lesser means uh, reducing their insulin intake uh, to, their, to detriment of their health, but they can't necessarily afford it. You see that happening with pill splitting. You see that happening with services reduction until people, particularly elderly people, become so isolated because there's nobody there to visit them. You know, that's the thing that we can address. And that's the thing that is so valuable uh, to civil society. So as you're, as you're expanding, and as you're uh, upgrading your infrastructure, as well as your you, the individuals who provide those services and the funding for those services, are you going to be able to maintain your very good record of, of ensuring that only, what did you say, 12% go to administrative overhead? Are you going to be able to maintain that? Or are you going to have a period of time when you have to invest where that balance might, because you're going to be building up, right? That, that'll that's be, right. Right? Well, yes. that's... Will that balance tip a little bit for a couple of years? How are you doing your financial planning? So we anticipate that in a, in a five-year stretch, we will see the five-year average decrease considerably from where we are even today. But you're absolutely right, Mark. There is always a need, whether you're a for-profit organization or a nonprofit organization, you know, we're, we're, we're still a corporation, right? Um, I like to refer to us as a business with heart or um, some of those folks that are for-profit companies are uh, for-profit and we're for-purpose. So we are a for-purpose organization, but at the end of the day, we are a business. And so uh, we will need to make some considerable investments in our infrastructure. Uh, the folks that we hire uh, won't be able to do their jobs very efficiently or effectively for the first three or four months. So there will be some lack of revenue and addition of expenses, et cetera. So yes, we absolutely anticipate that to be the case uh, in the next 18 months to two years. Uh, with the full understanding and approval of our board of directors, of our local funders, et cetera, because we have done, I believe, a really good job. I have an outstanding leadership team here and an outstanding direct services or service coordination team here. Um, and I believe that, that we've done a really nice job over the last three or four years of painting that long-term picture for our board of directors and for our community um, uh, partners so that they understand that when all is said and done, this is going to be a much better solution for all people with disabilities, but it will take some money uh, uh, to get us there. And so, yes, we we have a fund balance, right? We, we have a, a fund balance that our board of directors has allowed us to use. And our state of Colorado partners have talked to us about helping to partner with some ARPA dollars that remain um, throughout Colorado to help us um, uh, to invest in those startup or transitionary services so that we can literally hit the ground running when we start to serve new people. I really like the way you describe this, Matt. You're, you're talking about needing a short-term investment, 
but you're also talking about on average over a five-year period of time, your administrative overhead is expected to come down, which is basically a return on investment in terms of cost avoidance, overhead cost avoidance, and greater direct services. You know, you're speaking my language. I come from Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCoopers and, and all these, these businessy folks who uh, are really focused on um, efficiency and, and profit and you're talking about the profit being the return is greater benefit. Every every buck has a greater bang, right? That's exactly right. So our stakeholders, right? We have shareholders or stakeholders just like a, a big, just like Amazon and Apple have shareholders. The difference is that our return on our investment is how much money do we then have to provide the services and supports that individuals with disabilities need how many more lives can we positively impact? And how do we use those monies most effectively to support individuals who have what we call unmet or undermet needs? So in the state of Colorado, for example, an eight-year-old who has uh, a diagnosis of autism may not qualify for Medicaid services because they're really hard to qualify for. So there are requirements like how many hours a night does this child sleep through uh, sleep through the night? Um, can this uh, child uh, speak on their own? Do they have behavioral issues? Do they, are they able to get dressed right? So it's a pretty strict and stringent space in Colorado. And ev again, every state is different. If that's the case, well, we have dollars that are unspent of local dollars that we that we can then use to support those unmet needs. The child and the family still have the need, even if they don't qualify for Medicaid or the level of services that they need. There is, um, there is one Medicaid waiver in Colorado that has a wait list uh, compared to, just to be clear, right? So there are about 3,000 folks waiting for the level of service of Medicaid um, that they need. And it's important, I think, for folks to know that uh, Medicaid services are not entitlement when it comes to direct care. So, um, you know, if if you have 100,000 new people move to Colorado and they all need food assistance, that's an entitlement program. Uh, direct services in long term services and supports for folks on Medicaid, that isn't an entitlement at the federal and state level. And so places like Texas have 100,000 people waiting on a wait list uh, where Colorado, um, uh, we're lucky to say, uh, because of some great work from uh, our former governor, current governor, et cetera. There are only about 3,000 folks, but there are still individuals who have that undermet or unmet needs. And so the more efficient and the more effective that we can be in running our organization, that means that we're able to return those dollars to our shareholders, our stakeholders. And those ultimately are people with disabilities. Well, you've had a, some phenomenally visionary governors and, and the legislature has, has also uh, really been very supportive. Hickenlooper and, and now Jared Polis. We're doing some work for them at the intersection of art and economy, right? So to create a state that is welcoming for creatives. I think that your point, and, and let's close with this point that you raised in the beginning, which is that 25% of us are going to be affected by uh, by disability, personally. And not only that, but those who we love are going to be caring for us in some way. So it's not just 25%, it's 25% and everybody who knows the 25%, which is the rest of us, right? That's so right. what you're doing is you're making a state that is attractive for those of us who will be affected by disability sometime in our lives. And that's everyone. That is and that's everyone. everyone. That's right. Van Alken, Executive Director and CEO of Developmental Pathways. Thank you so much for sharing the work of your people, of your boards, of your funders. Please thank them all for us. Thank your volunteers. Thank your clients because they are part of the services that you're shaping. And really, it, it's just been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks again.